Welcome back for the fourth and final lecture of Marx After Growth. I'm Sean O'Brien and this lecture series has been brought to you by the good people at the 87 Press. You can find the lectures including recordings and transcripts on their blog The Hive. Many thanks to the 87 and everyone involved in design, editing and promotion for all your great work over the past few months. In this final session, we're going to talk about the class relation, what it is, how it's reproduced, and how the dynamics of its reproduction have important implications for how we conceive of the production of gender, the ascription of race, and the changing horizons of cycles of struggle, especially as the reproduction of the class relation is thrown into crisis in the late 20th century. First, though, we need to define the class relation. So what is the capitalist class relation? The class relation is the relation between capital and labor, a relation in which the capitalist owns the means of production and the laborer owns nothing but her labor power, and therefore an antagonistic relation in which each depends upon and reproduces the other. Capital finds the source of surplus value in the exploitation of labor, while the worker finds the means of subsistence in wage labor. So the first critical point to make here is that class is not an identity or social group, nor is it a structural position located within a social landscape. Such empiricist and structuralist approaches to class can be called, as Richard Gunn has argued, sociological conceptions of class. In contrast to the sociological approach, the Marxian approach sees class as a relation a relation of antagonism between capital and labor that cuts across society and the individuals who comprise it. As Gunn writes, quote, the sociological conception of class faces the embarrassment that not all individuals in bourgeois society can be fitted tidily into the groups which it labels capitalists and proletarians. This embarrassment is produced by the conception of classes as groups or places and to escape this embarrassment, sociological Marxism has recourse to categories like the middle classes, the middle strata, etc. Such categories are residual or catch-all groups and, in short, theoretical figments generated by an impoverished conceptual scheme. The Marxist conception of class, on the contrary, faces no such difficulties. It regards the class relation, say the capital-labor relation, as structuring the lives of different individuals in different ways. We've talked already about this relation in terms of its historical specificity and distinction from other forms of class society, whereas slave societies and feudal societies, for instance, are defined by personal relations of domination and direct relationships of force, the capitalist class relation is defined by objective domination and impersonal compulsion. These objective dependency relations, Marx writes, appear in such a way that individuals are now ruled by abstractions. So the capitalist class relation cannot be reduced to a straightforward struggle between capitalists and workers. Recall Michael Heinrich's insistence that, quote, capitalism rests upon a systemic relationship of domination that produces constraints to which both workers and capitalists are subordinated. And even worse than that, the worker produces this relation of abstract domination herself, and in fact does so by the very act of her labor. As Max Horkheimer puts it, quote, human beings produce through their own labor a reality which increasingly enslaves them, end quote. In other words, class struggle is not simply a struggle over the spoils of the production process, since what constitutes each pole of the class relation as a class is not simply the appropriation of surplus value by the capitalist class, but the form of the production process itself. As Moshe Postone argues, quote, the struggle between producing and appropriating social groups does not, in and of itself, constitute them as classes, even if the antagonism of workers and capitalists is structured such that ongoing conflict is an intrinsic feature of the relationship, end quote. This emphasis on objective domination has led some theorists to argue that class struggle should be seen as quote-unquote system imminent, including Postone, who argues that class struggle is in fact quote structurally intrinsic to capital, suggesting that this conflict is quote a constituting moment of the dynamic trajectory of the social whole 
and a driving element of the historical development of capitalist society. Fair enough. But as Werner Baumfeld reminds us, quote, however much capital appears to have autonomized itself, it presupposes human social relations as its substance, end quote. As Baumfeld argues, human beings constitute this abstract form of domination through compulsory participation in the reproduction of the class relation, a relation of antagonism which, in Baumfeld's words, quote, is founded on the continued separation of labor from its means. Marx makes this point in Theories of Surplus Value, where he writes, quote, accumulation merely presents as a continuous process what in primitive accumulation appears as a distinct historical process, as the process of the emergence of capital, end quote. That is, accumulation proceeds through the reproduction of the class relation. How then is the class relation reproduced? This question is of central concern for Marx, who insists that the appearance of a society of free individuals pursuing their rational self-interest necessarily, quote, abstracts from the conditions within which these individuals enter into contract. When discussing social reproduction, Marx distinguishes between simple reproduction, by which he means a rate of accumulation necessary to sustain society at a given standard of living, in which the production and consumption of capital goods is equal, and expanded reproduction, which refers to the reinvestment of capital to increase the scope and scale of production. Marx then proceeds to examine simple reproduction and argues that, quote, whatever the social form of the production process, it has to be continuous. It must periodically repeat the same phases. A society can no more cease to produce than it can cease to consume. When viewed, therefore, as a connected whole, and in the constant flux of its incessant renewal, every social process of production is, at the same time, a process of reproduction. Simple reproduction occurs in every society, then, and refers in the most basic sense to the necessary way in which a given society must produce enough surplus to replenish the means of production used up in the production process. As Marx writes, quote, no society can go on producing, in other words, no society can reproduce, unless it constantly reconverts a part of its product into means of production. In any society, then, a portion of the product, a kind of minimum surplus to consumption, is needed to ensure the reproduction of the conditions of production. If production has a capitalist form, Marx writes, so too will reproduction. Quote, just as in the capitalist mode of production, the labor process appears only as a means toward the process of valorization, so in the case of reproduction, it appears only as a means of reproducing the value advanced as capital, i.e. as self-valorizing value. End quote. In other words, if the object of the capitalist production process is not the satisfaction of needs but the production of value, the capitalist process of reproduction is nothing other than the means by which the production of value can continue. If we look at the production process in isolation, it appears as if variable capital, or the cost of wages, and constant capital, or the cost of means of production, are both advanced by the capitalists. But as Marx demonstrates, when viewed in terms of reproduction, we see that the capitalist does not actually advance his own money but rather the product of the unpaid labor of others from the previous cycle of production, and that all capital is in fact surplus that has been capitalized over time. The purchase of labor power for a fixed period is the prelude to the production process, Marx writes, but the worker is not paid until after he has expended his labor power and realize both the value of his labor power and a certain quantity of surplus value in the shape of commodities. He has therefore produced not only surplus value, Marx continues, but also the variable capital, the fund out of which he is paid, before it flows back to him in the shape of wages, and his employment lasts only as long as he continues to reproduce this fund." End quote. So it's not only that the capitalist pays the worker only a portion of the value she produces. As Marx writes, quote, what flows back to the worker in the shape of wages is a portion of the product he himself continuously reproduces. 
The capitalist, it is true, pays him the value of the commodity labor power in money, but this money is merely the transmuted form of the product of his labor." End quote. The variable capital advance, then, is nothing other than the product produced by the worker and transformed into money. What's more, quote, if the labor fund constantly flows to him in the form of money that pays for his labor, it is because his own product constantly moves away from him in the form of capital. But this form of appearance of the labor fund, i.e. money, makes no difference to the fact that it is the worker's own objectified labor which is advanced to him by the capitalist. End quote. This is also true for the value of constant capital, as Marx goes on to show. If an investment of $1,000 yields a surplus of 200 bucks a year, and sticking with simple reproduction, the capitalist consumes this surplus each year, then over five years the capitalist will have consumed the entire value of his initial capital, which has been replenished over this period by the appropriation of an equivalent surplus. Now it is true, Marx writes, that he has in hand a quantity of capital whose magnitude has not changed, and that part of it, such as buildings, machinery, etc., was already there when he began to conduct his business operations, but, as Marx insists, we are not concerned here with the material components of capital, we are concerned with its value." End quote. In other words, once the capitalist has consumed the entirety of his original investment, quote, the value of, as Marx puts it, his present capital represents nothing but the total amount of surplus value appropriated by him without payment. Not a single atom of the value of his old capital continues to exist. Seen from this angle, it makes no difference where the total capital came from initially. Over time, it necessarily is replenished by appropriated surplus value. A fund, or what Marx describes elsewhere in terms of a revenue arising out of capital, which the worker reproduces continuously so long as she is employed and out of which is drawn the purchasing costs of both constant and variable capital. Therefore, Marx summarizes, entirely leaving aside all accumulation, the mere continuity of the production process, in other words, simple reproduction, sooner or later and necessarily converts all capital into accumulated capital, or capitalized surplus value. Even if that capital was, on its entry into the process of production, the personal property of the man who employs it, and was originally acquired by his own labor, it sooner or later becomes value appropriated without equivalent, the unpaid labor of others. Here, then, is not only the production of surplus value, but the reproduction of the capitalist class relation. As the worker reproduces capital in the form of surplus value which is appropriated by the capitalist, and the capitalist reproduces the conditions of exploitation as a necessary feature of the process of capital accumulation. The capitalist pays the worker the cost of her reproduction, which she uses to purchase the means of subsistence she has herself produced, and once spent, leaves her once again with nothing to sell but her labor power. In Marx's words, quote, the capitalist class is constantly giving to the working class drafts in the form of money on a portion of the product produced by the latter and appropriated by the former. The worker gives these drafts back just as constantly to the capitalists and thereby withdraw from the latter their allotted share of their own product. Put another way, the worker receives a portion of the product they produce, as Marx writes, but not directly. Their access to this product, which is in fact the property of the capitalist according to bourgeois property law, is mediated by money paid to the worker in the form of wages. These wages are then returned to the capitalist when the worker purchases their own product back from the capitalist in the form of commodities in order to reproduce themselves. This, in effect, means that the production process is also a reproduction process. Marx writes, quote, The worker himself constantly produces objective wealth in the form of capital, an alien power that dominates and exploits him, and the capitalist just as constantly produces labor power in the form of a subjective source of wealth which is abstract, exists merely in the physical body of the worker, and is separated from its own means of objectification and realization. In short, 
the capitalist produces the worker as wage laborer. This incessant reproduction, the perpetuation of the worker, is the absolutely necessary condition for capitalist production. In other words, it's not simply exploitation, but the reproduction of the class relation through the production process itself that forms the basis for the accumulation of capital. Of course, how all this got started is another question, namely that of so-called primitive accumulation, or the separation of the worker from the means of production, a kind of originary separation, but Marx brackets this historical discussion for now. The point is that, regardless of how the capitalist acquired the initial capital, after a particular length of time, sooner or later, all capital is, as Marx puts it, value appropriated without equivalent. So, Marx argues, the worker and the means of subsistence forever move in opposite directions. Quote, From the standpoint of society, then, the working class, even when it stands outside the direct labor process, is just as much an appendage of capital as the lifeless instruments of labor are. Even its individual consumption is, within certain limits, a mere aspect of the process of capital's reproduction. That process, however, takes good care to prevent the workers, those instruments of production who are possessed of consciousness, from running away, by constantly removing their product from one pole to the other, to the opposite pole of capital. And if wages and operating costs are paid out of a fund generated as a revenue by previous labor, and if workers are paid only enough to maintain themselves at a given standard of living or a given level in order to return to work, then capital continues to grow and workers continue to rely on the wage for their subsistence. If, therefore, as Marx argues, quote, a division between the product of labor and labor itself, between the objective conditions of labor and subjective labor power, was therefore the real foundation and the starting point of the process of capitalist production, in other words, so-called primitive accumulation, then he continues, quote, what at first was merely a starting point becomes, by means of nothing but the continuity of the process, by simple reproduction, the characteristic result of capitalist production, a result which is constantly renewed and perpetuated." End quote. It's therefore no coincidence that workers and capital meet time and again in the marketplace, the former with nothing to sell but their labor power as the latter own the means of production. Workers and capitalists are both in fact reproduced by the production process themselves. The relation between capital and labor, what we have been calling the capitalist class relation, is as much a product of the production process as are the use values that are produced as commodities. As Marx writes, quote, capitalist production therefore reproduces in the course of its own process the separation between labor power and the conditions of labor, end quote. At the end of each cycle of production, both worker and capitalist return to the position from which they started. The capitalist process of production, Marx summarizes, seen as a total connected process, i.e. a process of reproduction, produces not only commodities, not only surplus value, but it also produces and reproduces the capital-labor relation itself, on the one hand capitalist, on the other wage laborer. Capital accumulation therefore constitutes a historically distinct mode of social reproduction, which is the reproduction of capital as a social relation. This diagram, which you may remember from the first lecture, shows what is called in the French translation of capital the double moulinet, or double millstone. The reproduction of capital covers the production and circulation of capital, or what we discussed in that first lecture as the general formula for capital, MCM prime. And the other sphere covers the reproduction of labor power through the consumption of commodities purchased with the wage. The double moulinet, or what Marx calls Zwickmühle in the original German, refers to a grave dilemma, being caught in a trap or an iron grip. And this sense of the term will be important when we turn to look at the relationship between cycles of accumulation and cycles of struggle later in the lecture. But it's worth noting here that social reproduction, and indeed the reproduction of the commodity labor power, requires additional activities entirely absent from this picture. When Marx discusses the reproduction of labor power, he does so in terms of activities that are directly mediated by the market. 
if Marx is uninterested here in those activities necessary for the reproduction of labor power that aren't directly market mediated, that's because, as Maya Gonzalez and Jean Natan have argued, quote, the activity of turning the raw materials equivalent to the wage into labor power takes place in a separate sphere from the production and circulation of values. Marx's focus on the production and circulation of values effectively precludes an analysis of reproductive activities that are indirectly market-mediated and how they might relate to the directly market-mediated sphere, to borrow terms developed by Gonzalez and Natan in their essay, The Logic of Gender. Though a sort of thoroughgoing history of Marxist feminism quite clearly lies outside the scope of this lecture, I want, therefore, to pause here and consider the Marxist feminist critique of social reproduction. There's an expansive history of Marxist feminist engagement with the relationship between the gender distinction and capital accumulation, particularly in terms of social reproduction and the gender division of labor. In the 1970s, for instance, Maria Rosa de la Costa and Selma James began to argue that, despite being unwaged, Women's reproductive and domestic labor is central to the process of capital accumulation in that it's necessary for the reproduction of labor power. In Women and the Subversion of the Community, Dalla Costa argues that, quote, on a world level, it is precisely what is particular to domestic work, not only measured as number of hours and nature of work, but as quality of life and quality of relationships which it generates, that determines a woman's place wherever she is and to whichever class she belongs, end quote a place capital dictates to women insofar as they are, quote, transformed into a function for reproducing labor power, end quote. And in a similar vein, James states in Sex, Race, and Class that, quote, our feminism bases itself on a hitherto invisible stratum of the hierarchy of labor powers, the housewife, to which there corresponds no wage at all, end quote. Drawing on Della Costa's work, Maria Mies has noted that, quote, the housewife and her labor are not outside the process of surplus value production, but constitute the very foundation upon which this process can get started. The housewife and her labor are, in other words, the basis of the process of capital accumulation, end quote. And more recently, Silvia Federici, who I quote, with certain serious reservations given her turn to trans-exclusionary feminism recently, writes, quote, the body has been for women in capitalist society what the factory has been for male waged workers, the primary ground of their exploitation and resistance, as the female body has been appropriated by the state and men and forced to function as a means for the reproduction and accumulation of labor. These arguments emerged historically with the Wages for Housework movement, or more formally, the International Wages for Housework campaign which was founded in Padua, Italy in 1972 by the militant feminist group Lotta Feminista, a splinter of the Italian far-left Patera Operaia, or Workers' Power, in conjunction with like-minded groups such as Revolta Femenil in Italy, Midnight Notes in the US, and the Power of Women Collective in the UK. Insisting that the domestic sphere was a primary space of capitalist exploitation, and thus a crucial site of anti-capitalist resistance, the Wages for Housework movement demanded that domestic work, and by extension reproductive activities in general, be understood as work, challenging both the capitalist division between paid and unpaid workers, and the notion that domestic labor is an unproductive and thus less politically significant form of work. The Wages for Housework movement was tied to the second wave feminist movement and shared many of its concerns at the outset, particularly in terms of challenging quote, the dominant view of housework as something natural for women, but gradually became distinct from mainstream 1970s feminism as the latter became increasingly focused on formal equality in the workplace. As Federici writes, quote, wages for housework as we intended it was a product of the same revolt against domesticity and quote unquote male supremacy that the rise of the feminist movement of the 70s expressed, although we brought a different strategy. Often referred to as a body politics, feminist politics, at least in its first phase, was a reproduction politics, centered on the idea that domestic life is a site of unequal power relations and, quote, revolution begins at home, end quote. This concern did not last. With few exceptions, by the mid-70s, most feminists had abandoned reproductive work as a terrain of struggle, 
concentrating their efforts on gaining entrance into the male-dominated occupations, obtaining equal pay for comparable work, campaigning for the Equal Rights Act, or gaining legitimacy within the academic world. Wages for Housework was an exception to these trends. Like other feminists, we were convinced that housework was the root of our oppression as women. Unlike them, we believe that for this very reason, it should be our main ground of struggle and that the most effective way to free ourselves from it should be to refuse to do it for free. Contentious claims about value production aside, claims long since abandoned by Marxist feminism, the Wages for Housework movement faced harsh criticism for its focus on white women in industrial countries, particularly from the black radical Marxist Angela Davis. There was certainly a black Wages for Housework movement as evidenced in this photo, but as Davis argued in the case of South Africa, the apartheid government was so successfully able to dismantle the domestic life of black families in an effort to undermine stable black community that it would appear to undermine the wages for housework thesis that capital requires domestic work. Davis also noted that many women of color were doing paid domestic work in the homes of white families and that unlike in the isolation of the domestic sphere, quote, on the job, women can unite with their sisters and challenge the capitalists at the point of production, end quote. But her main criticism of the movement was that the housewife becomes indistinguishable from her job, that her subjectivity is invested in and informed by it, and that wages won't fix that problem. But was this really the argument of the Wages for Housework movement? In fact, the campaign never intended for domestic workers simply to be paid a wage. As Federici clarifies in Wages Against Housework, originally published in 1975, quote, to say that we want wages for housework is the first step towards refusing to do it, because the demand for a wage makes our work visible, which is the most indispensable condition to begin to struggle against it, both in its immediate aspect as housework and in its more insidious character as femininity. This shift in articulation from for to against in the essay title is meant to emphasize that the demand for wages for housework was actually meant to politicize the domestic sphere as a space of capitalist domination and thus a primary site of struggle, and was part of a strategy that aimed to challenge the entire system of social reproduction upon which capital accumulation is built. The Wages for Housework movement, as I mentioned above, emerged out of Italian workerism or operismo which had already begun to examine the relationship between capital accumulation, communist struggle, and unwaged or non-industrial forms of work, particularly in terms of what Mario Tronti called the social factory. As Della Costa writes, quote, the territory as social factory struggles on wages by the various entities that inhabit it. All this was already a fundamental assumption of workerism, Italian workerism. But the feminist movement revealed that women work behind the closed doors of the home, that the home is a production center, it produces and reproduces labor power daily, that capitalist accumulation passes through two great poles, the factory and the home. Therefore, the woman is the main subject of the social fabric, but there's no housework in Marx. This was the discovery of those most accustomed to handling capital. Marxist feminism then can loosely be understood to emerge on the one hand from the recognition that the gender distinction under capitalism is tied to capitalist social reproduction and the reproduction of the commodity labor power, and on the other from a general consensus that Marx and many Marxists since have overlooked this fact. The logic of gender picks up on this line of thought but refines it in value theoretical terms. Quote, Marx reduces the necessary labor required to produce labor power to the quote-unquote raw materials purchased in order to accomplish its reproduction. Any labor necessary to turn this raw material, this basket of goods, into the commodity labor power is therefore not considered living labor by Marx, and indeed, in the capitalist mode of production, it is not deemed necessary labor at all. This means that however necessary these activities are for the production and reproduction of labor power, they are structurally made non-labor. This necessary labor is not considered as such by Marx because the activity of turning the raw materials equivalent to the wage into labor power takes place, as I mentioned earlier, in a separate sphere from the production and circulation of values. 
These necessary non-labor activities do not produce value, not because of their concrete characteristics, but rather because they take place in a sphere of the capitalist mode of production, which is not directly mediated by the form of value. Gonzalez and Natan thus reject earlier claims that reproductive labor is value-producing. In their account, all reproductive work is dead labor, since it adds no value to the commodity it produces, labor power, whose value is determined solely by the basket of goods equal to its reproduction, and not the effort involved in turning that basket of goods into the commodity labor power outside direct market mediation. Their focus instead is on the production of gender as social form. The logic of gender thus marks an emergent line of thought in Marxist feminist critique. Influenced by communization theory and the German new reading of Marx, the analytical framework presented by Gonzalez and Natan provides an alternative to what they argue are the inadequate binaries of productive and reproductive, waged and unwaged, and public and private, for understanding the relationship between the gender distinction and capital accumulation. In place of these categories or binaries, the logic of gender proposes two overlapping spheres, the directly market mediated sphere or DMM sphere and the indirectly market mediated sphere or IMM sphere as categories of analysis for understanding the types of domination required to quantify and enforce different kinds of productive and reproductive activities. Here's how they explain this distinction. The wage buys the commodities necessary for the reproduction of labor power and it also buys services which participate in this reproduction, whether directly by paying a private nanny, for example, or indirectly, for example, by paying taxes for state expenditure on education, which is part of the indirect wage. These services, whether they are productive of value or not, have a cost that is reflected in the exchange value of labor power. They imply, in one way or another, a deduction from surplus value. What remains are the activities that are non-waged, and that therefore do not increase the exchange value of labor power. These are the non-social of the social, the non-labor of labor. They are cut off from social reproduction. They must not only appear as, but also be non-labor. That is, they are naturalized. They constitute a sphere whose dissociation is necessary to make the production of value possible, the gendered sphere. While abstract value productive, including reproductive labor, is socially determined by direct market mediation and hence involves, quote, no structural necessity toward direct violence, end quote, being characterized by objective domination and impersonal compulsion, as we've discussed previously, activities belonging to the indirectly market mediated sphere of non-labor, including paid non-value producing reproductive work, are compelled by other mechanisms, quote, from direct domination and violence to hierarchical forms of cooperation or planned allocation at best. The relation between the gender distinction and capital accumulation has been a key concern in the communization current, evidenced in a series of exchanges between Marxist feminists and the post-68 ultra-left collective Thierry Communiste, or TC, which have played out in the pages of communization journals Endnotes and Seek, the materialist feminist journal Lies, issues of TC's own journal, and a number of other publications, including communization and its discontents. But what's communization? Communization can be defined as a conception of revolution that rejects any notion of transition, positing instead the revolution itself as communization, insofar as the former directly and immediately produces communism through the implementation of communist measures. T.C. write, quote, In the course of revolutionary struggle, the abolition of the state, of exchange, of the division of labor, of all forms of property, the extension of the situation where everything is freely available as the unification of human activity, in a word, the abolition of classes, are measures that abolish capital imposed by the very necessities of struggle against the capitalist class. The revolution is communization. It does not have communism as a, pro as a project and result, but as its very content. In other words, the revolution will be communist, or it will not be, as in Notes writes. No seizing of the means of production and managing them in a socialist state. No socialist commodity production, according to the dictates of so-called Marxist political economy. No affirmation of labor. No dictatorship of the proletariat. 
All of this is rejected outright by the communization thesis. Communization then, in the words of the Endnotes Collective, quote, is the immediate production of communism, the self-abolition of the proletariat through its abolition of capital and state, end quote. More specifically, communization seeks the abolition of, quote, the capitalist class relation and the complex social forms which are implicated in its reproduction, value form, capital, gender distinction, state form, legal form, etc., as well as the abolition of race as an indicator of structural subordination in Chris Chen's words. Communization is therefore also a practice, the practice of making communism, understood to develop historically through distinct cycles of struggle, which TC member Roland Simon defines as, quote, the whole of the struggles, organizations, and theories that constitute a historically defined practice of the proletariat and the reciprocal implication between the two terms of the exploitation, which is to say the class relation, or the contradictory relation between capital and labor. Cycles of struggle are here theorized according to a periodizing logic rooted in Marx's categories of formal and real subsumption, which we've talked about in previous lectures. According to Marx, already existing labor processes are first formally subsumed in their pre-capitalist forms through the introduction of the wage. To produce surplus value under such conditions, capital must lengthen the working day beyond what is necessary for the reproduction of labor power, producing what Marx calls absolute surplus value. Driven by competition and limits to the working day, capital increases the productivity of labor via technological ratcheting, reducing the amount of socially necessary labor relative to surplus labor, producing what Marx calls relative surplus value. For TC, this process of real subsumption entails what they describe as the integration of the reproduction of labor power in the cycle of capital, and thereby changes the nature of the contradiction between capital and labor such that the two relate to each other internally. A great cinematic example of this process of integration can be found in a scene from the classic film Modern Times of a worker who goes by the name Worker and is played famously by Charlie Chaplin, repeating over and over again the same gesture of tightening bolts at the assembly line. Modern Times is quite clearly about the de-skilling of labour, the monotony of the Fordist assembly line and so on, but the film also stages the integration of labour into the machinery of capital. In a sense, modern times, in C.N. Nye's words, quote, stages the breakdown of a factory worker's subjective boundaries into the wrenching function he is paid to repetitively, repetitively perform. Okay, but seen from another angle, we might say that the film demonstrates how the subject is produced as worker through the act of wage labor. In other words, Real subsumption is also the production of worker identity and is at the root of a long cycle of struggles based on the affirmation of labor. TC called this affirmative politics programmatism, or the struggle of labor to affirm itself as a class, both within and against capital, and aim to historicize it, programmatism that is, as a cycle of struggle key to the period of capital accumulation in which the integration of labor into the reproduction of capital gives rise to the growing strength of the working class and its forms of organization. Quote, Generally speaking, we could say that programmatism is defined as a theory and practice of class struggle in which the proletariat finds, in its drive toward liberation, the fundamental elements of a future social organization which becomes the program to be realized. This revolution is thus the affirmation of the proletariat, whether as dictatorship of the proletariat, workers' councils, the liberation of work, a period of transition, the withering of the state, generalized self-management, or a society of associated producers. Programmatism is not simply a theory. It is, above all, the practice of the proletariat in which the rising strength of the class in unions and parliaments, organizationally, in terms of the relations of social forces or of a certain level of consciousness regarding quote-unquote the lessons of history, is positively conceived of as a stepping stone towards revolution and communism. In TC's account, this cycle of struggle comes to an end in the 1970s with the defeat of the workers' movement and the restructuring of the class relation, 
which dissolves the various institutional constraints that mediated the antagonism between capital and labor, including, for instance, the welfare state, the official organs of the workers' movement, and national labor markets. For TC, as EndNote summarizes, this process of restructuring, quote, represents a counter-revolution whose result is that capital and the proletariat now confront each other directly on a global scale. There are serious problems with using Marx's categories of formal and real subsumption as periodizing models, as numerous others have pointed out, and yet it can't be denied that something fundamental has changed in the relation between capital and labor since the 70s, a fact made most obvious in the growing superfluity of labor and that the old class mass party sequence is obsolete, as proletarians experience class belonging no longer as leverage, but as limit. Marx, you'll remember, talks about growing labor superfluity as an inevitable outcome of capital accumulation. He writes, quote, it is in fact capitalist accumulation itself that constantly produces, and produces indeed in direct relation with its own energy and extent, a relatively redundant working population, i.e. a population which is superfluous to capital's average requirements for its own valorization, and is therefore a surplus population. As we've seen, this process of expulsion from the labor process follows from capital's tendency to increase productivity by reducing the time socially necessary for the production of a given commodity, producing relative surplus value. With the reduction of socially necessary labor time, however, the density of fixed capital in the production process rises, squeezing labor out of the cycle of accumulation. Again, Marx is instructive here. Quote, the higher the productivity of labor, the greater is the pressure of the workers on the means of employment, the more precarious, therefore, becomes the condition for their existence, end quote. For Marx, then, quote, and I think this is key, proletarian must be understood to mean, economically speaking, nothing other than wage laborer, the man who produces and valorizes capital, and is thrown onto the street as soon as he becomes superfluous to the need for valorization, end quote. In his essay on what he calls wageless life, Michael Denning makes a similar point, noting that, quote, unemployment precedes employment, and the informal economy precedes the formal, both historically and conceptually, end quote. Denning argues, quote, we must insist that proletarian is not a synonym for wage laborer, but for dispossession, expropriation, and radical dependence on the market. You don't need a job to be proletarian. Wageless life, not wage labor, is the starting point in understanding the free market. Indeed, as Marx argues, the essential superfluity of the proletariat is imminent to the wage relation, insofar as the free laborer is always already, as he puts it, a virtual pauper, a pauper in waiting that over time becomes a pauper in actuality. Crucially, this process by which labor is made superfluous does not result in the disappearance of work, as various theorists of automation have suggested in either apocalyptic or utopian terms over the decades. Rather than mass unemployment, the growing superfluity of the proletariat is exemplified by generalized underemployment, since workers might sell their labor power for an amount beneath the threshold necessary for their reproduction. As Aaron Beninov and John Clegg have argued, quote, this surplus population need not find itself completely outside capitalist social relations. Capital may not need these workers, but they still need to work. They are thus forced to offer themselves up for the most abject forms of wage slavery in the form of petty production and services, identified with informal and often illegal markets of direct exchange arising alongside failures of capitalist production. This is why, as Angela Metropolis argues, rising precarity, quote, might well indicate a decrease in the actual time of work while nevertheless amplifying all the senses in which one is always available, always preparing for, or always seeking work, end quote. Expelled from production, labor is forced to seek the means of its reproduction in the sphere of circulation, greasing the wheels of capital as facilitators of exchange rather than producers of value, often for meager wages. Consider the explosive growth of the service sector since the 1970s. The service sector by definition resists technological innovation, which is why it has been the primary site for absorbing surplus populations and why it tends toward low productivity and low wages. 
This is the outcome of real subsumption. For, quote, in a society based on wage labor, as Beninov and Clegg write, the reduction of socially necessary labor time, which makes goods so abundant, can only express itself in a scarcity of jobs, in a multiplication of forms of precarious employment, end quote. In recent years, certain communization theorists have also sought to tie the process of racialization to the production of surplus populations. If capital accumulation expels human labor from production, gradually devaluing the commodity labor power, then this process of expulsion might also be, at least according to certain theorists, what produces the abstraction blackness in an era of deindustrialization. Quote, when the commodity labor power no longer exists, the human container that would have possessed this labor power endures as an empty shell. All that is left is a physical residuum an inert fleshy materiality that marks the lack of labor power, a purely physical existence without a subjectivity. Here you might notice that the author is drawing on the language of Afro-pessimism and black feminism. So they continue, the human container is desocialized, or in other words, a thing that is without any social utility. Ultimately, this purely physical existence is reduced to mere appearance in which the phenotypical attribute comes to mediate and determine the form of social existence of this human container once it is integrated into the class relation. Consequently, blackness appears as a representation of the lack of labor power, its positive instantiation. The phenotypical attribute, blackness, comes to naturalize this lack as an inherent attribute of the human container itself, whereas it is merely the social representation of the absence of labor power. The above argument rests on the conception that, with the expulsion of labor from the production process, the reproduction of the class relation is thrown into crisis and the value of the commodity labor power falls towards zero. In this sense, they argue, there occurs an internal differentiation in the reproduction of the class relation. On the one hand, there is the social reproduction of labor power, and on the other hand, the asocial, physical reproduction of human beings. What remains is a de-socialized fleshliness that persists as quote-unquote mere residue. While Marx called this process pauperism, or the result of this process pauperism, the process of pauperization here comes to, quote, assume the form of racialization of the distinct sections of the proletariat. In other words, to appear as racial blackness. Thus, quote, the structural position of those racialized as black objectively embodies the imminent tendency of capital's non-reproduction, end quote. Deindustrialization, then, and the expulsion of labor from the site of production is simultaneously a process of objection at the level of class composition, a casting off that has visibly racializing effects on the sociological appearance of unemployment. Race, having a material function for capital, emerges as an economically modulated demographic rather than an identity category that precedes mediation. Racialization figures as a feature of exploitation tied to the recomposition of capital, while exploitation becomes properly legible only when read across the history of racial domination. Joshua Clover's theory of riot as, quote, the confrontational struggle for social reproduction outside the sphere of production, end quote, aims to think racialization together with the end of programmatism. Clover seeks to grasp what he describes as the internal and structural significance of riot, according to which what he calls riot prime emerges as the form of antagonism appropriate to, quote, the ongoing and systemic capitalist crisis that has unfolded throughout the capitalist world system since the 1970s. Drawing on Giovanni Arrighi's model of systemic cycles of accumulation and Robert Brenner's account of the transition in the 1970s from long boom to long downturn, both of which we discussed in the previous lecture, Clover situates this crisis, which he understands in value theoretical terms as, quote, an increasing domination of dead over living labor, end quote, in relation to what he calls the arc of accumulation arguing that, quote, both Brenner and Arrighi succeed in excavating the strong relation between the logical account of self-undermining accumulation and the historical account of capitalist cycles. Synthesizing these accounts, he writes, quote, from roughly 1830 to 1973, 
There was a core of productive capital in the West with its ratcheting system of expansion. And it is according to this that Clover calls, quote, the period from the 18th century to the present a metacycle, a great arc of accumulation in the capitalist world system following the course of circulation, production, circulation prime. Tracing a history of struggle against the backdrop of this arc of accumulation, Clover identifies three hegemonic forms of antagonism. Riot, or the setting of prices for market goods, which prevails in the pre-industrial markets of mercantile economies. Strike, or the setting of prices for labor power, which replaces riot as the dominant form of struggle during the decades of industrial expansion. And Riot Prime, in which the riot, having returned transformed, now operates, quote, within a logic of racialization that takes the state rather than the economy as its direct antagonist, end quote. Clover maps this tripartite sequence onto Marx's formula MCM prime, or money, commodity, money prime, and thence to the schema adapted from Arrighi of circulation, production, circulation prime. For Marx, as we discussed in lecture one, MCM prime represents the general formula for capital, whereby monetary value congeals in the commodity form only on the condition that it be realized at a profit. This is the process of capitalist accumulation understood generally as a circuit through which the total sum of capital increases with each profitable reinvestment. As Arrighi argues, however, quote, Marx's general formula of capital, MCM prime, may be reinterpreted as depicting not just the logic of individual capitalist investments, but also a recurrent pattern of world capitalism. The central aspect of this pattern is the alternation of epochs of material expansion, MC phases of capital accumulation, with phases of financial expansion, CM phases. Citing Arrighi, Clover writes, quote, the first transition riot strike corresponds both historically and logically to the Industrial Revolution and its extension and intensification of the wage relation at the beginning of Britain's long 19th century. The second transition, Strike Riot Prime, corresponds in turn to the period of hegemony unraveling at the end of the United States' long 20th century, a rise and a fall a certain shapeliness amid the mess and noise of history, delivering us now to the autumn of empire known variously by the terms late capitalism, financialization, post-Fordism, and so forth, that dilating litany racing to keep pace with our protean disaster. During phases of financial expansion, no real recovery of accumulation is possible, but only more or less desperate strategies of deferral. Under these circumstances, circulation increasingly displaces production as the primary sphere in which both capital and labor seek their reproduction. Clover uses the term circulation struggle to name those struggles that occur in the sphere of circulation, which include riots, but also blockades and occupations, all of which are defined as struggles for the means of social reproduction outside the productive sphere. And in the era of riot prime, circulation struggles take on a distinctly racialized form. In Clover's words, quote, the riot is an instance of black life in its exclusions and at the same time in its character as surplus, cordoned into the noisy sphere of circulation, forced there to defend itself against the socially and bodily death on offer, a surplus rebellion. In the absence of steady economic growth, as labor markets slacken and unemployment rises, these riots remind us that any theory of communist politics today needs to reckon with the distance between the working class and the proletariat, a gulf that widens daily as the demand for labor continues to decline and the figure of the wage worker recedes from its once central space on the world stage. It seems sort of impossible to pick the right moment to stop and bring this lecture series to a close with so many questions left unanswered and with no doubt a surplus of internal contradictions and incommensurabilities left unresolved and unaddressed. I hope, despite these limitations and shortcomings, that the series has been useful for helping to make sense of our topsy-turvy world, and maybe even providing you with the means, or at least some ideas for how to go about intervening in it. Thanks once again to the 87 Press for hosting, and to all of you who've tuned into the series.
If you'd like to think through these things further with me, please feel free to get in touch. Thanks.